Hallelujah. Well, let's get into the Word of God tonight, please. And let's go over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel. And we are going to look at chapter 30 in the Word of God tonight. Amen. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And while you're turning there, would like to encourage everybody to listen to the message that was uh, taught this morning. It's very, very, very important. And it will help you. It will protect you uh, in your life. Amen. To make the right kind of decisions. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Okay. The title of the message this morning was The Way We Are and the Way We Were. So you want to listen to that. I encourage you to listen to that. Amen. All right. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verse 1, if you have it, say praise the Lord. Now, <clears throat> before I read this to you, I'm going to be speaking tonight on the subject of depression, discouragement, depression, bitterness, you know, whatever you'd like to call it, and uh, how to overcome that in your life. Amen. And, and so, uh, chapter 30, if you'll look at it, please, beginning with verse 1. Amen. Say, and it came to pass. When David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away. And went on their way. So David and his men came to the city. And behold it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons. And their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him. Lifted up their voice and wept. Until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahinoam. The Jezreelitess and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. And literally bitter. That's what it means, bitter. The soul of all the people was bitter. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither or thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. Give us the inspiration that we need to preach it. To receive it, to hear it, to walk in it. We thank you for your presence in this house tonight. We give our hearts to you and our minds, our spirits, our souls, our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. And if you would turn over into the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul says this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. That is a promise. God says that he will make a way of escape. Literally, he will give you a way out. Now, when Paul speaks there, he's not telling us that God is going to come and remove the temptation. What he's telling you is that the picture 
in the language, as you study it, is a ship has gone through, amen, and it's found a place of rest on the other side. Okay, y'all with me here? So in life, God is not going to come and spare you from every temptation and every trial. He's not going to do that. But what he's promised is that when you get through it, there's going to be a place for you to land. There's going to be a way out. So whatever you're going through tonight, look for that. Don't look, don't look for maybe God to come and take it away. But look for when you get through it that God's going to have a place for you to land. That God's making a way out for you. Amen. Praise God. And the Bible says there's no temptation but what is common to all men. Everybody's tempted. Everybody goes through things. But the promise that we have is but God will make a way of escape through that temptation or out of that temptation when we're going through it. Amen. And David went through something like that in his life. And he ended up in a place called Ziklag, a place of depression, a place of loss, a place of tears, a place where the Bible says they cried till there was no more power to cry, a place of bitterness, a place of distress, a place, this, let me just put it to you so you understand, this man was hurting and he was hurting bad. But God shows us a way out of that. How did David get to that place of ziklag, depression, and loss, and tears? What brought David to this place in his life where he was so broken? Well, I want to back up just a little bit and show you what was going on in the story. When we back up to chapter 27 in 1 Samuel, we see what brought this all about. In the 26th chapter, the Bible tells us that what is happening in the life of David is that there's a man by the name of Saul who is trying to kill him, trying to destroy him. And so David's been running from place to place, etc. And he's in the process of running for his life. There are people that have gathered around him. About 600 people have gathered. He's got a congregation of about 600 people. And as he's traveling and, and, and whatnot and running from Saul, God gives David a tremendous victory in this 26th chapter of 1 Samuel over Saul. So that Saul actually recognizes that the hand of God is with David. And even Saul, his enemy, declares to David, David, you're going to prevail. You're going to win. In the end, you're going to win. And so David has a tremendous victory in, in 1 Samuel 26. He's, he's flying high. But right after that victory comes chapter 27. And, and so what I've noticed in life and you've noticed in life and I've talked to others and people talk to me about this is that oftentimes when you have tremendous victories in your life that right after that victory there comes a time that seeks to take that victory away. And it's a very difficult time. And that, that was David. He had a great victory. But then right after that. The Bible tells us in chapter 27. In that time of victory. That he started talking to himself. And as a result of talking to himself the wrong way. This began to lead him down. Into a spiral, a spiral of depression. And we'll see that in, as we go through the steps here. It is important for you and I not to, to talk to ourselves wrong. We ministered to you a little bit about this morning. How that we need to have a, uh, a proper view of God. We need to look to God in our lives for help. We need to think right. We need to look to God and trust God and believe that God is there. Amen. So we got to think right in our lives. we got to speak right. And we've got to live right. And so what, what brought about the, a time that I've read to you tonight about was, first of all, David wasn't talking right. 
Now, David was anointed three times in history. Later on, he'll be anointed three times. That means he was anointed as prophet, priest, and king. Now, there are very few people in the Bible that were typically anointed as prophet, priest, and king. David was one of them. So, in symbolic typology, he was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Very rare man. And this rare man who had the anointing of prophet, priest, and king. This man fell into a time of depression. And it all started out after a time of victory. He started talking to himself the wrong way. Now, I'm, pe- I'm speaking to the children of God tonight. I believe that, that you're saved. Amen. And, and salvation doesn't exclude the possibility of us spiraling down. And it starts with, number one, most of the time, you'll have a season in your life where you're really doing fantastic. You're doing well. And then after that, there's a season and you start talking to yourself wrong. And this was David. The Bible says, <clears throat> David said in his heart, see, he starts talking to himself. He said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Now, David is anointed to be the king of Israel. He's anointed by God. There's a prophecy on the life of David. But instead of trusting what God said to him about what God was going to do with his life, David gave in to depression or unbelief. And he started talking to himself. And he said, you know what? Someday I'm, Saul's going to kill me. Now, that's not what God said. That's what David said. And so because he started talking wrong to himself, even though, listen, even though God had a plan that was totally opposite of that, because he started saying that in his heart, that's what caused the spiral down. Amen. Now, God... God has great promises and and great things that He wants to do for you in your life. But if you're not careful and I'm not careful, we can end up where David is because we start talking to ourselves. And we we really, we start, in a sense, prophesy bad things to ourselves. And so David's problem starts by talking to himself the wrong way. And so he says, there's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. So at this point, he's he's doubting God. He's lost his confidence in God. And he's talking to himself wrong. And he starts making plans. And the plans are... To go and join the adversary. He goes and joins. Listen to me. The adversary. He joins the Philistines. And the Philistines are enemies. To the people of God. He joins them. He's out of God's will. He's not trusting God. He's not believing the word of God. And he goes and joins the enemy. Now, that's, that's really, uh, the, that's what the enemy would like for you to do, is for you to get out of God's will and run over here and run over there and run over there and run over there. Start talking to yourself, and you're getting out of God's will, and so that's what happened to David. And, and I promise you, when David made that decision to, to go and join the Philistines, in his mind, it's going to work out real good. See, I've got this figured out. And it's going to work out real good. But we're going to see by the end of the story that it doesn't turn out like David thought it would. So he's not trusting God. He's doubting God. He's joining the enemy. And in this chapter 27, there's some things that you will notice. He doesn't pray. He doesn't pray. He doesn't seek God in this chapter. He doesn't write any psalms in this chapter. 
He's going by his emotions. And he's letting his emotion govern him, controlling him. And so he's doubting God. He's going to move out of the will of God. He's not praying. He's not seeking God. Amen. Amen. He's not writing any songs uh, in his life at this point. And so this is the beginning of David's problem. The Bible goes on and says in verse 2, And David arose and he passed over and 600 men that were with him unto Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. Wow, he chose the adversary. So whenever David does this, he goes and joins the adversary. See, he's still a believer on the outside. But because of what he's saying to his heart on the inside. You get the point? He's not believing on the inside. But he's still a believer on the outside. And he's really joined with the enemy. No prayer life. No songs of praise. And so basically David at this point is backslidden. David dwelt with Achish at Gath and he and his men. Every man with his household. Even David with his two wives. And Hinoam the Jezreelitess. Abigail the Carmelitess. Uh, Nabal's wife. Now. It would be one thing for David to be doing what he's doing. If it was just David by himself. But what we see here in the story is that the decisions that David have made. By talking to himself wrong and then going to the, to the enemy. Getting out of the will of God. That it's actually affecting other people. It's affecting his wives. When he, goes, when he gets out of God's will and he goes over to Gath. He's taking his wives with him. So it's affecting other people. You with me? In verse 4, the Bible says it was told Saul the day was fled to Gath. And he sought no more again for him. Wow, see. Now the enemy is no longer pursuing David. It looks like and it feels like that he made the right decision. To join the enemy. Because now. The adversary Saul is no longer chasing him. And so that's what will happen. You know you start making the wrong decisions. You're getting out of the will of God. You're not praying. You're not singing any songs anymore. You're talking wrong in your own heart. You're affecting other people around you. You're a, you're a believer on the outside. But you're not believing on the inside. So you start making decisions that, that are not good. And uh, at first it might look like that it is working for you. Because now the pressure's off. Woo! The battle's not there anymore. Well, why? Because he gave up. He surrendered. There's a lot of people. They, they, they get tired of the fight. They get tired of the battle. So they'll surrender to the enemy. And then they look at, well, boy, I, I feel a lot better now. Well, the reason why you feel better is because the enemy is no longer after you because you quit. Come on, somebody. And so now he's out of God's will. He's in the flesh. He, he, the enemy's no longer chasing him. Why? Why? Because he's not in God's will. He's no longer in the fight. So it feels good. Wow. I don't have to worry about Saul anymore. Everybody awake? So what, what he experiences is temporary pleasures. And that's all they are is temporary pleasures. Yeah, the enemy's let up now. Whew. Man. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Amen. See, David at this point is confused. He's confused. He's walking in disorder. 
He's given himself to every evil work. He's just really confused. You know, he's got the enemy chasing him that is supposed to be somebody in the church. Saul's supposed to be a Christian. But Saul's trying to kill him. Now, I thank God for one thing. That David didn't just throw up his hands and say, forget the church. Forget this. If this is what Christianity is all about, I don't want anything to do with it. When he looked at a man who claimed to be the anointed of God, that claimed to be a Christian, if you will, a man acting like that, trying to destroy him, he could have said, forget it. If that's what Christianity is all about, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But God's grace intervened for David and did not let him get that kind of spirit or that kind of attitude toward the church. Praise the Lord. But nonetheless, David is confused. He's out of God's will. And so in verse 6, Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, whereof Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the Bible says, And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. See, it led to a lengthy stay of com in compromise. David has been in a long, hard battle. Saul has been chasing him. It's been a difficult and long battle. He's making wrong decisions. He's in the flesh. He's out of the will of God. He's joined the adversary. He's not praying. He's not singing. Amen. Amen. 